part 23, who the fuck did I marry? So we agreed to do marriage counseling. Um, I had found a pastor and his wife who agreed to do our counseling, basically. Our counseling was going to be on Zoom and it was going to be every other week, um, every other Tuesday. Initially, Legion was um, participating in it. Um, his body language seemed to be that he was open and receptive to the marriage counseling. Now, the pastor and his wife were deeply concerned at the fact that we had only been married three months and we were already dealing with some form of infidelity. We were in marriage counseling and as the pastor would put it, there seems to not be any sort of intimacy. Um, they were concerned. Rightfully so, I think any person would be if they knew what was going on within those three months. So um, the pastor and his wife, it is it is fair to note, we started counseling with them um, in the spring. We continued counseling with them up until a week before I found out what I found out and he got kicked out. So one of the first things that um, the pastor kind of talked to us about was, um, you know, are you, what, what was the deal with the Facebook messenger stuff? Um, and Legion was like, it was stupid. I shouldn't have done it. Um, it was just, it really was just attention and it just, I got carried away. He, he felt like he was not going to, he kept saying, I'm not going to keep apologizing. I'm not going to keep getting persecuted um, after I told you, I'm sorry, I told you I wouldn't do it again. And I want us to move forward. You're either going to forgive me or you're not. The pastor and his wife were like, wow, um, the audacity is real on this one. <laughs> so needless to say, we started moving slowly forward. Um, it was always in the back of my mind, just like it was in the back of my mind with that black Dodge Charger. It was one of those things where, okay, I see how you kind of are moving and operate. He came to me a few days after we started our first counseling session. And he was like, we should um, get a joint bank account. What he wanted to do was to each one of us have our own account and to get a joint account for our money to go in there um, for joint expenses. Now, up until this point, he had been paying the rent, the utilities, and I really was just paying for my stuff. So now he's suggesting, look, we're married now. Let's go ahead and get a joint account. I wasn't necessarily against it because I knew that I would still have my own account. I would still have my own savings. So what I countered with was, OK, let's take a look and see what we're working with. Show me your checking. This is not the uncle that died. Another uncle. My uncle always told me, you know, j just keep your money tight because women can be. I said women like we're married. So go ahead and show it to me. He would not show it to me. So then we went back into marriage counseling, like the next session, and I bring it up. I said, he will not show me these two accounts that he claims has the money in there to buy a house. I told a pastor and his wife, I said, I saw the pre-approval letter, so I don't understand why he's not going to show me to just put me at ease that he has the money in there. I had never questioned it before because again, you tell me who in their right mind signs their name to a legally binding offer, an all cash offer on a house. And they, they just do it willy nilly. I don't know anyone that does that. So I actually never questioned what was in the savings because I clearly saw him sign his name to a $699,000 all cash offer on a house. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go back to the parts in this playlist where I talk about what he did when we were looking for a house. So the pastor and his wife were like, Legion, that's not his name, y'all, that's a nickname. Legion, why would you, why would you not show your wife your savings account? Like what, what's going on here? 
And so he made up some bullshit. And I remember the pastor's wife was like, something, something ain't right. And so at this point, Legion kind of shuts down. He's just like, look, y'all are not going to tell me when and where I can open. I open up my accounts to show anybody the money I earned. I earned that money. I earned that money by playing football, blood, sweat, and tears. He went to this whole Denzel Washington monologue about how he earned that money. And no one, no woman, no one is going to come in and tell him that he needs to open up the account. So then he starts talking about the ex-wife and how she tried to get money from him in the divorce back when they were in California. So now the pastor and his wife, their red flags are just like, whoa, so much so that the pastor's wife said, and I will never forget this. She said, I don't think you all are going to make it to January. What she was talking about is I don't think y'all are going to make it a year. And I really, truly was like, we're going to make it like, of course, we're going to make it. And she was just like, I don't have a good feeling about it. And so Legion's all defensive. He he at this point, he's folding his arms and he and because remember, we're on Zoom. He's folding his arms and he's just like, I'm I'm done with this, like. I'm not going to get attacked because I'm not comfortable showing you the amount of money that I have. Money changes people. And I'm not comfortable. So he's playing that victim card. Um, And so the pastor and his wife were like, you know, we we're we're still going to help y'all as much as we can. But so he was like, I'm not comfortable. And basically the pastor and his wife were like, look, we'll help y'all as much as we can, (laughs) but there's some deep issues here. And, you know, had you, this is what they advised us. Had the two of you came to us for premarital counseling, we would have told you, do not get married. Y'all should not even be together. That is what our parents. That is what the pastor and his wife told us in marriage counseling. If you two had come to us for premarital counseling, we would have told you y'all should not even be together, let alone get married. But here we are. So we will help you guys as much as we can. But the pastor's wife was like, I don't have a good feeling that y'all are going to make it a year. Part 24. Who the fuck did I marry? So remember we're in April. Um, we're now moving towards the end of April and he still did not show me his, um, savings account. Saw the checking, saw the chase savings. So he decides that we should start looking for a house again because my lease was up in August and I made it very clear that when the lease is up, I am moving. I wanted to move to Cobb County. So, um, He was like, you know, we need to get the ball rolling. I didn't want any parts of it. Didn't want any parts of it. He found a realtor. This time it was a woman. It was a woman. Um, And I believe her name was Amber. I think her name was Amber. So he found a realtor and kind of we, you know, he told her what the budget was. Amber started finding houses. So please understand, or you don't really have to understand, but um, I believed, I believed he was a sane, rational human being. Sane enough that you would not sign an offer on a home if you didn't have the money. That's what I believed. So when we started working with Amber, Amber, I believe, showed us three or four houses. It was not nearly as many as the other realtor, Scott. So one of the houses um, absolutely loved. Oh, I love the house. Um, I really wanted to put in an offer on that house and I'm going to post it on the screen. The house, love that house. 
it was just absolutely beautiful. And once again, he wanted to put in an all cash offer on the house. But before he could put in an all, he had told Amber, I want to put in an all cash offer. And what Amber, the woman, was smart enough to say is, okay, let's just go ahead and take it one step at a time. Let's go ahead and get your pre-approval stuff together. She said, I work with a great lender who, if, you, if you're not already pre-approved, um, he can get you pre-approved, no issues. Um, and then if you want to do an all cash offer, then we'll go ahead and get the proof of funds together. So that way we can submit it all with your offer. Y'all already know what happened because you remember what happened on the last house with Scott. Um, basically, Legion was like, well, I can get you whatever you need. That's fine. But I really don't want to submit proof of funds unless they accept the offer. Amber, and I don't know where she is. I don't even know if she'll ever see this video. Um Anyway, let me keep going and I'll explain why that woman has a special place in my heart. So Amber was like, you know, I totally understand. Um, but this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> um, I'm going to need that paperwork. OK, and um, we'll submit it with your offer. It, she she just simply was like, yeah, this is how we're going to do it. And so he did not submit the paperwork um, when she had asked him to. And I remember I was driving to work and I stopped at the quick trip on Upper Riverdale Road in Riverdale, Georgia. And Amber had called me. It was it was in the morning. She had called me. Um, and I believe with all my heart that Amber knew something was up, but she also knew I did not know what was up. So she called me and she was like, I just don't understand. Like, if he has the paperwork, like you can submit the paperwork. But the issue was the Chase paperwork that I had was from a year prior. So my understanding was that it pretty much was no good at this point. Um, so she said, he can, all he has to do is just email it to me or take a picture of. She was like, I just need to know that he's able to back up his offer. And I said, I totally get it. Um, and she was explaining some stuff to me. She was like, you know, he needs to do X, Y, and Z. And so I said to her, I remember I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, um... I'm going to get down to the bottom of it, but I don't know what's going on. And so let's put a pause on this whole thing. Let's put a pause on looking at houses. Let's put a pause on um, getting his pre-approval letter because I'm not sure what's going on. And she got quiet and she said, okay. I said, and I know this sounds weird. And she said, no. She said, that is actually very smart. She said, um, do your research. And if I can be of assistance, call me. She said, whether you buy a house with him or you buy a house on your own, I will be more than happy to represent you. I don't know where Amber is today. But that one sentence, I felt like, I felt like just woman to woman, she was basically telling me something ain't right. Baby, something ain't right. And now you need to open your eyes. I'll be more than happy to work with you. Um, if y'all get your shit together, I'll work with both of you. But whether you buy a house or not, do your research and then let me know what I can do. That was our conversation at the quick trip on Upper Riverdale Road. So I got off the phone. Um, that was the last time that 
we worked with any sort of real realtor. That was the last time that we looked at any sort of house. Um, and I don't know, I don't remember exactly what happened after that meeting that day. I do know that when I went home, I simply told him, I don't want to look at a house right now. Um, I said, I think it's okay if we rent. Um, we'll just find a house in Cobb County and just rent um, for a year. And let's, and let's build, you know, f- save some more money. Let's just, um, let's not worry about buying a house right now. And basically what I was trying to do was save face because that was the first time with Amber that I actually was embarrassed at the fact that we're wait, we, he and I, because I felt like I was complicit in the fact that I'm going to look at houses with him. I felt like we are wasting these people's time. I did not mean to waste your time. I clearly see my time as being wasted, but that doesn't mean I need to waste your time. And I felt embarrassed at the fact that we wasted her time um, coming across as serious buyers. When time came to put up or shut up, nothing was put up. And I knew nothing. I had nothing to add to the, to, to add to this because we're talking about a $650,000 house. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't make that. I don't make anywhere near that. So it just became one of those situations where I was trying to save face. I was trying to save face with my husband and I was trying to save face with Amber. And so I did say to him, let's just rent for another year. And then let's see um, at that time where we are, if we should go ahead and buy. So now is when shit is about to get real. Part 25, who the fuck did I marry? So we weren't looking at houses anymore. We were not working with a realtor anymore. The end of April, I had decided that I wanted to look for another job. I did. The reason I wanted to look for another job is petty. Yeah, it is. I wanted to look for another job because I was pissed off at the fact that, um, I had basically was dependent on him to help with the car note. So I wanted to look for another job where I could afford life all by myself, including that car note, basically where I would make more money. I told him that I was going to start looking for another job. He laughed. And his exact words were, you're not going to leave Georgia State Patrol. He was like, I swear you love them niggas more than you love me. He laughed. So that fueled me even more. So I was hitting the pavement hard trying to find another job. I was applying to all kinds of places. Got a phone call um, from my current job. So this is how I ended up in my current job. Got a phone call um, They and they had sent me an email with a background packet. The background packet was long and extensive. But in the background packet, it asked for my spouse's full name, my spouse's date of birth, and my spouse's social security number. So I showed it to Legion and I was like, I need your social because, you know, I'm applying for this job. It's a great job. It's way more money. Um, And, you know, we're talking about moving anyway to Cobb County. So this, you know, this, this is a God thing. He did not want to give me his social. I explained, I I showed him the paperwork where I was like, look, because we are married, I I can't lie on here. So help me. (laughs) Um, So he writes down his social security number on the background packet. And um, I eventually turned it in. I had scanned it, saved it in my email and, and sent it in. And I looked at it one day, be just going through it, just making sure I didn't really miss anything. All T's were crossed, all I's were dotted. And I looked at his social and something about the social seemed different than the social security number that I remember seeing when we did our marriage license. 
And so for those who you remember in the previous part, I said I had ran his social security number from the marriage license. Nothing came back. So I thought that I had written it down wrong. Basically, what it is, is that the first three numbers were different on the background packet than what was on the marriage license. If you don't know this, here's a little trivia. Your social security number, the first three numbers, pretty much are dictated by the state you were born in and the state that issued your birth certificate. So he was born in Pennsylvania. So his social, the first three letters, excuse me, the first three numbers of his social security number should be attributed to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, shit, they probably got like five, six different numbers, uh, three digit numbers that your social security number can start with. So the social that was on the marriage license, for example, um, was probably one, two, three. What was on the background was four, five, six. Both of those social security three digit prefixes are issued through the state of Pennsylvania. Again, this is an example so I can make it clear. So when I saw his social on my background, I immediately knew that was a different social than what I saw on the marriage license. Um, and when I compared, because I, f I had found a copy of the marriage license that we turned in because I had filled it out on the computer. So sure enough, the first three numbers were different. The rest of the numbers were the same. So one of two things, either when I ran his background, I did in fact put in the wrong number or the number on the marriage certificate or the um, background packet is wrong. So I decided that I was going to roll the dice and take the social from the background packet. Again, this is the background packet that I had to fill out to get my current job. I was trying to get a new job. Okay, so I took that social and I ran a background check on it. What came back on this particular background were, was all the addresses that the social security number, I guess, had been um, attached to. So all of the addresses, the states were Georgia, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania. What I did not see was California. So I thought that was weird. I thought, okay, maybe this is not a complete background because clearly he went to San Diego State. It's on his resume. It's on it's on quite a few things. Social media. He didn't have a LinkedIn, but it was on his social media. So clearly he had he had been to California. So maybe I just need to do a different background check. Also to note during this time, he, um, I think I told you guys, he had hit his leg at work. So what was happening was it was getting more and more difficult for him to walk, like put pressure on that leg, on that knee. Um, he was still able to go to work. He was, he was still leaving at 6.15 in the morning. He was still coming back between 3.30 and 4 o'clock. But I clearly could see where he was in pain. Um, he would elevate the knee, ice the knee. It was it was getting worse. And I was constantly like, go to the doctor. Let me take you to urgent care so that they can look at this knee because you shouldn't still be limping and having a hard time um, putting weight on that knee. And every single time he was like, oh, you know, it's, it's fine. I have a doctor's appointment on Wednesday. The doctor just told me to ice it and to elevate it. Um, this happened. This is an old football injury. It happens all the time. It used to happen a lot when I was out in California. So I'm mentioning this knee issue for a reason. Um, but back to the background. So once again, when I ran the background the second time with his second social, it showed me states of Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. And that is all this that's all that I saw in terms of addresses. I didn't see anything for California. 
So by this point, we're moving into May of 2021. Things are starting to reopen. One of the things that reopened was San Diego State. So I called San Diego State. I called the registrar's office. Registrar's office. Um, someone did answer, and there was there was um, instructions on how to request a transcript. Um, I was able to try to request it online. You needed the person's the student's name, and I believe you also need their social. And when I typed it in, it said no results found. Um, I believe that I sent an email asking, you know, this person is, is saying that they were a student there. Can you verify it? The response I got was there were no records found with that social security number. <laughs> so I'm like, OK. I asked him about it. And in part 26, I'll tell you exactly what his response was. Part 26, who the fuck did I marry? So I asked Legion, what's the deal about San Diego State? He was like, what are you talking about? And I said, um, why is there no records of you there? <laughs> I just came right out and said it. Without missing a beat, this man said, well, I was a private citizen. What the fuck does that mean? And what he said is that when he started at San Diego State, his father paid money so that, okay, it's important I'd say this with a straight face. His, his father paid money so that his name and social would not be publicized and he would be considered a private student, a private citizen. Um, he said that he had a card where all he had to do was show the card. He does not have to give his name. He does not have to give any information because he had that card. He said, so San Diego State would not public, would not have any record of him, but he was in fact a student there. I said, and you claim that you played football. He was like, I did play football. I said, so you're saying that the school did not publish your name anywhere and they were in violation of NCAA rules. And he was like, why are you asking all these questions? And I said, I'm just curious. I'm just, meh, meh, I'm just curious. You're saying that you were a private citizen, but yet how did you, how were you in compliance with NCAA if you were a private citizen and they did not publish your name on any roster? So that was his excuse. He was like, all I can tell you is that I was a private citizen. My dad paid for it. Okay. So now I know that San Diego State has no record of him. Now I know that his social security number, at least the one that's on my back, my background packet, only shows that he listed in, he, excuse me, only shows that he lived in Georgia, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania. Okay. So at this point, the pain in his knee is getting worse. Uh, it's getting to the point where when he would come home from work, he would take a shower and immediately get in bed, elevate his knee. He was he was not even eating um, the way that he used to eat. It was getting to the point where at times... Um, if you remember when I told you all about the miscarriage, they gave me pain meds because I had taken that pill, but the pain meds I was allergic to, so I couldn't take them, but I still had them. So the pain in his knee was getting to the point where he would take one of those pain meds just to get through the night. He was constantly in agony, constantly kind of tossing and turning, so much so that in May he moved into the guest bedroom because I couldn't deal with the tossing and turning thing. And he just said he was more comfortable there. So what what at first was a, oh, I hit my knee at work, turned into, no, it was an old football injury. This has happened before. Turned into, you know, it's painful for me to walk on it. 
turned into it's it's actually hard for me to work on it. Um, but he was he was still going to work at 615 every morning and coming home between 330 and four. So um, it is again, I'm just giving you guys the chronological order of how all this happened. So at this point, we're not looking at we're not looking for a house. Um, I still have not seen the two savings account. I'm pretty sure there's no money in those savings accounts. But again, he was going to put in an all cash offer with Amber, the real realtor. So I really didn't know what to believe, but I, I believed what I saw, which is I saw that that background is not showing where he went to California. So at one point in May, it was close to mid-May, he calls me from work. He calls me from work, calls me while I'm at work and tells me that he got a phone call from his stepson. The phone call from his stepson, the stepson was crying and was just absolutely distraught. And I'm at work in my office like, what's going on? And he says to me that the stepson informed him that his stepdaughter passed away. That she died from COVID. The stepson, found, this is the story. The stepson found her in her apartment because they had not heard from her for a couple of days. And she was unresponsive. He called the ambulance. They pronounced her dead when she got to the hospital. So he was calling to tell me that she had died. Um, and he was also calling to ask me if I would object to him giving his ex-wife $2,000 towards the funeral. As I've stated before, and I, and I still am this way to this day. I don't play about death. So when he told me that she died, I immediately went into the, all right, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, whatever we can do to help, let's help. Because surely nobody would make that up. So he, he again, he was like, are you, are you okay with that? He was like, we're married. And the agreement was that anything over $500, would be a discussion. So 2000, definitely. And I said, yeah, I said, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, he was upset because again, he was close with the kids and my heart went out to his ex-wife. It did because I, I can't even imagine. I cannot even imagine. So Part 27, who the fuck did I marry? So here's what we are at and here's what we can establish. Number one, I ran an initial background check on the social security number that was on our marriage license. Nothing came back. I subsequently applied for another job. In that job, I had to fill out a background packet. The background packet asked for my spouse's name, date of birth, and his social security number. The social security number on the background packet for the new job did not match the social security number that he gave me for our marriage license. If you are confused, I believe it's in part 25 or part 26 that I explain that. So we can establish that I then ran a background check on the new social security number that was on my background packet, it came back with um, address, or excuse me, states that it that the social security number apparently had lived in. Those states were Georgia, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island. Okay. I decided, this is now around May 20th, I decided to do another background check. Um, and I paid to do another background check. This time I did it with a different company and not only did it give me the addresses, excuse me, not only did it give me um, the states, it gave me addresses and it also gave me names of people who 
were like associated with Legion and that address. One of those names was his ex-wife. I've always known, he's, he's always told me the name of the ex-wife, but now I see it when I ran his background. I did a search for her on social media. She was not there. So the address that it showed that she was associated with, with him, because remember his story is we got married in San Diego. We lived in San Diego. We divorced in San Diego. Men lie, women lie. The U.S. federal government, which is a security number, does not. So um, he's saying he was always in California. His social security number never showed that he was in California, according to the background check. It did show that he had lived in Georgia at an address associated with the ex-wife. So... Tried to find the ex-wife, could not find her on social media. So I looked in the metro counties to protect her identity. This, I am going to not divulge a lot on this part. I looked in the metro counties in the, um, the open record courts. So typically, you know, you can look in like superior court or magistrate court or probate court. So I looked in open records for the different counties, metro counties, metro Atlanta counties. Let me be clear, metro Atlanta counties. And I looked under her name and I found where they had filed for divorce in a metro Atlanta county. So when he said that he filed for divorce in San Diego and that he was married in San Diego, I was able to find, no, according to the state of Georgia, you were married here. You were divorced here. So I looked under her name, found a record, found a record for divorce, and it did show his name. So now I clearly see on my computer that there is a Metro count, Metro Atlanta County court that has a divorce record in the state of Georgia between him and his ex-wife. So I did what any rational person would do because this is still kind of COVID time. Um, well, not really. It had nothing to do with COVID. Let me take that back. Because of the parameters of the court, you can only do the open records request in person. I did what anybody would do. I told my boss I had to go. I grabbed my purse, grabbed my keys, and I drove to the court to do the open records request in person. The open records request was for the divorce documents. Go back in the story, in the series, and remember, I went over, I did a background on the ex-wife. I told you all exactly what was told to me. He met her in California. He married her in California. He divorced her in California because she cheated on him. He filed for divorce. She tried to get spousal support. It, it, turned, it was going to be a little ugly. He was helping her with the kids. That was the story that was told to me. So... Went to the court, filled out the paperwork, got the open records request for the divorce decree, for the divorce records. First thing I see, he didn't file, she did. Second thing I see, they didn't make it more than six months. I see the, the date of marriage. I see the date of, the date of uh, dissolution, six months. Second, uh, third thing I see, he was served in Metro Atlanta, which means that at the time of the divorce, he was living in Metro Atlanta. Had nothing, California was never mentioned. Fourth thing I see, he filed what is called a pop, pauper affidavit. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to do my best to explain it real quick. Basically, he filed an affidavit with the court saying that he is so poor, he could not afford the fees to pay for a divorce. He couldn't afford a filing fee. He couldn't afford a service fee. That is what a pa pauper affidavit is for. All of this is in um, the divorce documents. She had filed. 
She said it was irreconcilable differences. She was not requesting any money whatsoever. Um, and both of them had signed a pauper affidavit. He was served in Georgia at his previous employment. According to the divorce documents, he was served at like a grocery store. That is what was listed as his employer. And it had a date of when he was served. So I see all of this in one day. I also see where on the divorce documents, she listed her name, her address, and her phone number. So I did what any rational person would do. I wrote down the phone number. There was a 50-50 chance that the number was already disconnected. She could be like me. I'm one of those people. Honey, you can sneeze at a 27-degree angle. I will change my number so quick, you ain't even know what hits you. You can talk to me at 5 o'clock, and at 5.05, my number has been changed. So she could have been like me, and the number is not even active. Or she could be like some people I know who have kept their number since kindergarten. Either way, I wrote the number down. I um, left the court and I immediately went back to work. And the same friend who helped me when I had my miscarriage, I told her, I was like, I got this phone number. This is the ex-wife. She was like, girl, you better call. You better call and, fi and find out from her. Because can't no, I think she said to me, can't nobody tell you what is going on quite like the ex-wife. So, part 28 is the phone call that I had with the ex-wife. Part 28 of who the fuck did I marry? So, I had the phone number, went back to work. Um, my really good friend was like, you better call her. You can use my phone, but call her. So I called her. Um, she answered. Let me use aliases. Um, and the conversation went like this. May I please speak with Barbara? This is Barbara. Barbara, this is Shirley. Shirley who? This is Shirley Jones. I am the wife of Legion. Silence. Then she starts laughing. And she said to me, and I quote, if you were calling me, then I know it's bad. I chuckle and I said to her, I'm not trying to bother you. I'm not trying to disrupt your life. I, I said, I am literally coming to you on some woman to woman shit. I said, because you are probably the only person who can help. <laughs> she and she she listened. She was she was gracious. And she said, um, she said, what is it that you need to know or what is it that you want to know? And I said, I understand that you and my husband talk and communicate. Um, and she was and she immediately said, what? No, we don't. And I said, okay. Um, she said, one thing you need to know about Legion. She said, whatever he tells you, it is a lie. And she said, when he, again, let's go back to part one. I told you guys that when he introduced himself or when we met, we actually had matched on two different sites and he was under two different names. One was an act was like the actual birth name. The other one was a nickname variation of that name. That's the name I know him by. So for example, if his name was Matthew, he had a profile under Matthew and then he had a profile under Matt. I would have known him as Matt. So she said to me, she was like, I don't even know who Matt is. She was like, that's not even his name. 
And so I knew what his actual government name is. She was like, no one calls him Matt. She was like, that must be his new, um, his new personality. Or she, she was cracking a joke, but she was like, anything he tells you, you need to know is a lie. So I just asked her, I said, what was your experience? I said, because I can tell you the story he told me and she, and she stopped me right there. She said, whatever he told you was a lie. She said, let me guess. He told you I cheated on him. Let me guess. He told you that I wanted money from him. And I said, yeah. And she said, yeah, that's a complete lie. Um, so we had a conversation where she told me how they met. Um, they didn't meet online or anything. I said, well, were you guys ever in California? She said, no. She's like, he, he, she was like, that man ain't never been from past the East Coast. So I said, okay, um, so you guys have always been in Georgia. And she said, yeah. She's like, we got married in Georgia and we got divorced in Georgia. And that's when she asked me, how did you even get my number? She said, because I want nothing to do with him. So how did you get my number? I told, And I said, I'm going to tell you the truth. It ain't going to make me look good. I told her, I said, this is, this is what happened. And this is what led to me doing research. And this is how I got your number. And she laughed. She was like, wow. She said, she was like, normally I would be freaked out. She said, but under the circumstances, she was like, wow. Okay. Um, she said, yeah, if you're calling me, then it must have gotten pretty bad. She said, so what did he promise you? And w we talked for about... 30, 35 minutes. She asked me in that phone call, she said, look, I want nothing to do with him. I have not spoken to him since our divorce was finalized. She said, so I would just appreciate if you keep me out of whatever's going on with y'all. And I told her, I said, I give you my word. I will never tell him I spoke to you. I said, I give you my word. I said, this, this, this conversation is for me. It is not for me to use in any sort of legal litigation, nothing. This is for me. And um, I said, I, I said, I don't plan to call you again. I don't plan to be a disrupt a disruption in your life. I just needed to know how bad is it? And she was she paused and she said, it's bad. She said, I don't know what all y'all got going on. She said, but if it's anything like what it was for me, it's bad. So we talked a little bit more. She was very encouraging. She was like, girl, do not blame yourself. She said, um, I went through that and I, I had blamed myself. She was like, this is not on us. This is on him. Um, she was like, he is a master liar a master manipulator. She said, I ignored the red flags. So she was like, do not feel as though this is on you. We talked about um, the ex, there's an ex-girlfriend that shares the name, that shares the same name as his aunt. She and I talked about her. She said, um, the reason why they broke up because the ex-girlfriend, I didn't know this, the ex-girlfriend had reached out to her about six months before he met me. And so <laughs> the ex-girlfriend lives in um, lived in Douglasville. On Legion's driver's license, he had a Georgia driver's license with the Douglasville address. What he told me was that it was the address that his sister, because remember I told y'all his sister Shantae lives in Douglasville. She's a nurse married with two kids. So he told me that the address on his license, it was his driver's license, was to Shantae's house. The ex-wife is telling me no. That's the address for the girlfriend, the ex-girlfriend. He had moved in with her and he created this whole narrative with her. 
she found out um, that he was lying and she kicked him out. And so I guess after she kicked him out, she then um, reached out to the ex-wife, kind of the way I did for confirmation. And so the ex-wife was just telling me, whatever that man has told you, it is a lie. She said, I got out before it got too bad. Um, she said, because once I knew he was lying, I was out. She was like, because he's never going to change. <laughs> um, and so, again, conversation went on and on. And so finally, we were getting ready to get off the phone. And before we got off the phone, I said to her, I said, if everything is a lie, I said, I have one question for you. And she said, sure. I said, how is your daughter? I said, how is your daughter? Next part coming up. Part 29, who the fuck did I marry? So I asked her, how was your daughter? She said, my daughter's fine. And I said, okay. She said, what did he say about my daughter? And I will be honest with y'all. I didn't have the heart to tell her. So what I said instead was, oh, no, it was, you know, with everything with COVID, I think he mentioned that she might have, um, she might have had COVID or was exposed to it. I downplayed it bad. I wasn't going to tell that woman that he said her daughter passed away. Um, so she, I said, you know, obviously I'm, I'm glad to hear that kids are fine. She, she said, look, whether you stay with him or not is your choice. She said, he ain't going to change. He ain't going to change at all. Um, she said, this, th this is what he does. She said, you're not the first. You're not going to be the last. She said, he did it to me. She was very, very encouraging because she was just like, you do not blame yourself. She said, you know, we both ignored red flags, um, but it is not your fault. She said, this is on him. And so we, you know, once again, I thanked her for her time, got off the phone. I took the long way home that night. Um, I, I could not be around him. <laughs> I could not be around him. I had to figure something out. I had to, I had to figure some things out. So I just, I, I took the long way home. What does that mean? It means that I purposely, I probably could have taken, oh, 75 to 285, but I probably took 20 to 75 to 285 to 675 kind of thing. Like I just took the long way home. Um, a couple of days later, because I really, my, my mind was spinning. A couple of days later, at this point, I'm turning into the FBI, CIA, and Homeland Security all in one, literally. I'm, I'm trying to find everything. Um, and he's carrying on his business as usual. Nothing changed with him. He had no idea that I had spoken to the ex-wife. He had no idea I had gone to the court and saw his divorce um, documents. He had no idea. So a couple of days later, I decided to look up his mother's obituary. Look up the mother's obituary. And um, down at the bottom where it talks about, oh, she's preceded in death by, and it lists all the people, the family members that died before. And then it says, leaving behind to cherish her memory. It lists the husband, his dad, her husband, excuse me. Let me start over. It lists her husband, which is Legion's dad. It lists Legion's brother that lives in Philly and his wife. Because again, this is a 2000. She passed away in 2015. So it lists Legion, the, the brother in Philly and his wife and daughter, her granddaughter. It lists Legion and his wife 
I think it was like Latoya or La, La something. La something. Um, it did not list the ex-wife I just spoke to. And it clearly said Legion, his wife, Latoya. Then it listed the brother in Nashville, his wife, Jane or whatever. So I'm thinking to myself, there's two things I was thinking immediately. Number one, um, who is Latoya? Never heard that name before. Never heard that name before. So I was thinking, who was Latoya? And then number two, where are the two sisters? Shantae and Kim. Shantae lives in Douglasville, married with two kids. Kim lives in Augusta, and I believe he told me she worked at like Procter and Gamble. So wh why aren't they listed on here? Because apparently, uh, go back to the video. I, I posted it on there. I gave y'all background on the family. He apparently was one of five through both parents, brother in Philly, older brother, younger brother in Nashville, an older sister in Douglasville, and a baby sister in Augusta. So why is it on his mother's obituary there's only three three children named? Where are the where are the two sisters? So I'm even more like, what in the hell's going on? And then I started thinking to myself, where why wouldn't they list Shantae? Like they talk all the time, so I know that they're close because he talks to Shantae all the time. So I, I really was confused. Again, keep in mind, I'm trying to give y'all insight into how I was thinking May of 20, uh, excuse me, May of 2021, because I still, still didn't find out a lot of stuff at that time. I found out enough to figure out, okay, it's not a question of if he's lying. That, that, that was over. It's not a question of if he's lying. The question now is becoming, what else is he lying about? So we had the phone call with the ex-wife. Now I see an obituary that apparently there's another wife. I know on our marriage certificate, it only states he had a pr one previous marriage. I had zero, he had one. So this is how I'm thinking in my head, which is, Okay, what am I what am I missing here? I know we've established that he's lying, but who who the fuck is Latoya? Like I'm really trying to understand who is Latoya. Um and again, he's he's hobbling around the house limping. And I'm I'm in our bedroom, well, in the bedroom just I mean, I could not get on Google fast enough to try to figure some stuff out. So, um, see the mom's obituary, study it. And at this point, I'm now trying to figure out, okay, what's the game plan? What is the game plan? And that's where we are about to get into the next part. Okay, part 30 of who the fuck did I marry? So I'm going to use this as a clarification video. So we're going to use part 30 as a stop. Let's clarify some things. Um, I've done that before on a previous set of videos. So I think it's just important to do that. So that way I can try to address some of the things that I have seen in the comments, um, both supportive and just downright mean. <laughs> but let me clarify some stuff. Number one, it is important to remember that I am telling this entire story of how I met, dated, married, and divorced my pathologically lying ex-husband. I am going in chronological order of events. So what that means is that, ma'am, sir, whoever you are, if you were coming in at part 30, but you have not seen part 11, some stuff is not going to make sense. I know, I know, I know it is a long playlist. Um, and don't worry about watching the video as soon as it comes out because 
everything I'm trying to do this um, responsibly of telling the story in the order of which things happen. So I say that to say, please, if you if you're able to start at the introduction disclaimer video, start with part one and then just watch each video, because a lot of the questions people are having that I'm seeing in the comments and I say this respectfully, it's just because you did not go to the other videos and watch them in order. That's just the first thing I want to say. Um, it is important that I get this story out, but that it's done, like I said, responsibly. To me, responsibly is being honest, even if it makes me look bad, but then also trying to be clear and not ramble all over the place. So I'm trying to take the time to tell you this is what happened at this time. This is what happened at that time. That's why there's so many parts and we're not even to the part of the divorce yet. We're almost there, but we're not there yet. Second thing I wanna clarify, I cannot stress this enough. My family and my friends did not know what was going on between Legion and I. They did not know. My family only knew we've met this guy. He's dating our daughter, our niece, our cousin, our granddaughter. He seems to be a really nice guy. He seems to really love her. Um, from what he has told us, he's done well for himself. He played football um, and he has worked at this company six, seven years and financially he is in a good place. From what we understand, he just moved here from California. That is what they knew. They did not know about the red flags I had. They did not know what was going on in my head. They did not know what was going on in my heart because I did not want to look stupid. I'm fully aware that when I tell this story, I look stupid. I'm aware and I've made my peace with that. But at the time, I did not want to look stupid. So it was important to me to put on a, everything's great. We're really happy. We're looking for a house and everything's going well. Knowing full well that behind scenes, I couldn't figure out why he wasn't showing proof of funds. They did not know. So I say that to say, I see the comments about how my aunt gave me horrible advice when I called her about the sexting on Facebook. And I want to clarify something. She did not tell me to stay with him. She did not tell me to leave him. That's not her place. And that's not what she would do. She simply was in shock that any of this had happened and did not know what to give me advice on. The one thing that she did say was, look, he's not your boyfriend, meaning it ain't as simple as, oh, we just going to break up, pack your shit and go because you married him. Ma is the most ride or die chick I've ever met. You fuck with me, you fuck with her. And she is straight Jersey. So I and I, I love her for it, but I need it to. It's not fair for me to leave it out there as if, oh, she just was like her. I mean, go home and deal with it. No, never in a million years. So I just want to I want to clarify that. Also want to clarify about my mom. So my mom lived in Arkansas and when she came to visit in April, this is, we were already married. This is her first time physically meeting Legion. My mom will tell you she had no idea anything was amiss, but there was something that nagged her a little bit. She didn't know what it was. And my mom is the type where she's gonna get on her knees in prayer. That's who she is. So for her, it was like, I don't know what it is. He seems like a nice guy. He seems to love my daughter. Um, there, Because again, there was no arguing in the house. The house was peaceful while she was here. Even though behind the scenes, we had just came off of the whole sexting incident with other women. So for her, it was like, I don't know what it is. She did tell me later on that it seemed as if I wasn't as happy as she thought I would have been. But again, she took it to the Lord in prayer and her prayer was God protect my child. I don't know what's going on, but protect her. 
that was my mom's response. So she did not know, she did not pick up um, or overhear something that was going on while she was while she was here. She had a conver- uh, candid conversation with Legion and Legion kind of came across as, it's, I miss my mom, I'm, he missed his own mother. And so he called my mom, mom and um, doted on her. Again, putting on a, sh- a charade. And so for her, it was like, you know, bless his heart. That's <laughs> that's what she said. Bless his heart. Um, but no, she did. She did not know the specifics. Nobody knew the specifics. They didn't know the specifics until we're talking May, June of 2021. They knew that we were looking for a house. They knew that the house fell through. They did not know about the proof of funds. They did not know that he wouldn't show me the savings account, the offshore account. So I just want to say that because to me, it would be irresponsible to not clarify what family and friends knew um, because they these people have always been supportive of me, always had my back. I just simply did not share with them the things that I felt like were red flags because again my mindset at the time was I want to be married and what if he isn't lying and you know I was making excuses for him to myself so I definitely would have made excuses to family another thing I need to clarify and I saw the comments on this about how a VP would never date someone that looked like me and to the person that wrote it that wasn't very nice um I need to I need you all to understand the relationship started in March of 2020. He had came he came into my life as regional manager. Okay? That is how he came into my life. Then eventually he got promoted to VP of production or operations, some VP of something. That was later on in the relationship. He showed me the paperwork where it, it was basically a memo from HR, you know, you've now, your new position title will be VP of pr- production. We'll just say production. Your salary, I don't remember the exact amount because it was a very specific amount, but it was over $200,000. It listed some of the benefits that he would have. Um, he would have an office, he would be getting an executive assistant. That's where we get David from. If you don't know who David is, please go back watch the series in order he would be getting an executive assistant he would be getting use of the company helicopter he would be getting a company car that is where we're introduced to the fact that he was starting to shop for a company car that could not be more than ninety thousand dollars that's what he told me i didn't see this in the memo the amount of the car but that's what he told me so that's where you get the car shopping for the Range Rover, the Jaguar, the um, uh, the B- the BMW. He even test drove a Mercedes uh, GLE, I believe. So I'm, I'm just trying to, again, bring some clarity to this so that way we all can understand what's going on. And hopefully this just makes a lot more sense for everyone. All right. Part 31.